The new one, we started it last week, we're going to continue with it, uh, called One Life, and here it comes, and our own lovely and talented Mary Hyland is going to uh, help me lead it with, you, with everybody, but I think we'll all be fine. Here we go, shall we? We are all connected, a global family, there's no Delighted that you've joined us in person or via Facebook Live and Zoom. For those who are here in person, please be sure to silence your cell phones. Thank you. And so now let's join together in prayer. <sighs> Heavenly Father, Mother Spirit, the all powerful, all loving, all giving Creator. As we turn to our center, where you most clearly abide, ready to comfort, heal, and nourish, there is no greater power, no greater love, no greater help. To be a part of this spirit is the greatest gift of all. I speak my word for all of us when I say that when we open our hearts and minds, to let truth take hold, we are comforted, healed, and nourished. We come to know more deeply that spirit will guide us to bring peace about in our lives. No matter what chaos seems to dominate the world, I turn to my faith and trust in spirit. How grateful I am to have this sanctuary, this teaching, to remind me of who I am. Also through the divine message delivered lovingly by our dear Dr. Mark. With this overflowing cup of gratitude, I release my word, confident of its manifestation into the absolute mind and action of God. And so it is, and together we all say, Amen. <laughs>
now please rise and join us in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing for our congregational song, once again led by Mary Highland, Amazing Grace. <laughs> meditate for the next five minutes. I invite you to close your eyes and silently repeat the mantra, God's the love that I am. If your mind wanders like mine does, just bring it back to silently repeating God's the love that I am. And I'll bring us out of meditation in five minutes.
not the things my family did. I am not the voices in my head. I am not the pieces of the brokenness inside. I am light. I am light. I am light. I'm not the mistakes that I have made or any of the things that caused me pain. I am not the pieces of the dreams I left behind. I am light. I am light. I am light. I am skin on the outside. I am not my age. I am not my race. My soul is all light. All light. All light. I All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, okay, I've got my, my act together now. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit today about anger. Um, you know, I have been on the spiritual path for a long time, decades now. And early on, I really believed that if I was angry, that meant that somehow I was not spiritual. I was not practicing. I was not really doing science of mind. Um, and now I, I come to see it a little differently than that. Um, so my anger might be, you know, just displeasure. My anger might be hostility. My anger might be annoyance. I think everybody has anger, though, so I would say it's, you know, it's kind of universal. Um, and I thought to think about, like, well, when, when are we first angry? And I think, well, babies get angry, don't they? Sure they do. Babies get angry. They want you to know something, right? And then, of course, well, I certainly remember as a teenager, teenagers get angry. Yeah, absolutely. And adults, well, see, so it's a problem for lots of people. Um, unless it doesn't interfere with your life. So where I am now, so I, so I remember hearing this story about the Buddha, that one of the Buddha's original uh, disciples, those first few who were in very, very close, died. And the Buddha was crying. And one of the other disciples said, well, you're the Buddha. Why are you crying? And the Buddha said, because I'm sad. Now, that has been very helpful to me on my spiritual journey because I think that what we have to do is be absolutely honest about what we are feeling, about what comes up for us. Now, over 100 years ago when Ernest Holmes, and it was almost 100 years ago that Ernest Holmes was developing this philosophy, I don't really believe that Ernest and Hazel and those early New Thought metaphysicians had a lot of access to their emotional world, to their emotional life. It was all just sort of strange and different. Now, because I believe that Ernest Holmes was actually a very clear vessel, because he was spiritually mature, Ernest had the capacity to speak the word and stuff happened. Right? Now, we have moments, I think, where we are that clear, where there's nothing within our conscious or subconscious mind that's contradicting the word we are speaking. And yes, we've all had those experiences where we have a wonderful healing and we have a wonderful demonstration. But 
so often not as often as it could be. So I wonder, why do we get mad? Um, you know, I, I hear people say, and I've certainly said this myself, my God, if they would just stop messing with me. Because sometimes that's what it feels like. It feels like someone or something outside of me is messing with stuff, you know? So, you know, we can be provoked by just normal, unpleasant stuff of every day, or, or if we see something that strikes us as unfair. But, you know, in the science of mind, we have to say that fair, when, you, when we start to say fair, unfair, there's a value judgment there. Right? Because what's fair over here may be completely unfair over here. Right? Um, it, I know that I can get provoked if, my, if it feels like the goals and what I'm working on and the direction I'm going get blocked. Um, I can provoke, be provoked if something was avoidable. You know? And yet, we didn't avoid it. We're having to deal with it right now. And also by those situations where I feel very, very powerless. But you know, what, I, what I'm learning to ask, because I have a practice, because I sit, because I meditate, you know, I say, what else am I feeling at this moment? I know there's anger here, but what else is there? And usually there are a bunch of other things as well. If I really sit and look honestly and try not to impose any of my will, I'll see that, oh, in addition to anger, I have some frustration. Oh, and there might even be like a little sadness here. And oh, there's maybe a cup and a half of depression over there. And all these other things are contributing. So it's never just that I'm just so, so angry. Um, how, how do we make sense of all of this, right? How bad is it? I think that people like to, um, I want to say this in a nice way, <laughs> because it's early on a Sunday morning. I think people like to um, exaggerate, even catastrophize the events of their life, you know, so they get a big reaction out of other people. Oh, my God, you'll never believe what happened. This was so wrong. This was so bad. This got me so upset, you know. Um, and, and, and what people often do is they misattribute the cause, I think, or they, they, it's easy to be overgeneralizing. Um, so... I think we have a right, I think it is right for us to be angry when we feel that we've been treated poorly. Now here's something that I think is good about anger, because I, I keep trying to look at it from different ways, is that anger alerts us to a potential danger, you know? That anger um, alerts us to injustice. You know, that sometimes we've just get so angry because we've just had enough. You know, it, en it encourages you to, to confront something, to deal with it, okay? So I would say if we went back far enough, probably everybody's response to they got, when they got angry is they'd pick up a club and start <laughs> hitting whoever or whatever was nearby. But thank God we have evolved from those times, right? <laughs> so it's no longer appropriate. And this is why, you know, because consciousness has evolved, this is why I think we have such a hard time when we see that violence out there. Now, we have the capacity, I believe, to some extent to regulate our emotions, you know, that we can channel that emotional energy of being angry and act worked up and I think this is the spiritual purpose of anger, is that we can channel that into something else. So it's, it's not necessarily bad to be angry. I don't think that it's wrong to, to be feeling it, because I think that this can motivate us to respond to situations in the world or in our own life in a greater way. We don't have to think hard about all the things that we could be angry about today, do we? No, there's tons of stuff. There's just tons of stuff. The menu is infinite, it seems. And so there are infinite, but, but also, there are infinite ways to express without violence, without hostility, without aggression. And you say, well, what, 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 what do I do with my anger? Well, I don't know. Maybe you're somebody who's called to protest. Or maybe you're going to write a letter to the editor. Or you're going to write letters to politicians. Or maybe you're going to volunteer somewhere. Or maybe you're going to create something that's going to support people. Maybe you're going to write a poem or a song. Or you're going to write a book or an article or something like that. There are lots of ways we can take that energy, I believe, and put it into something constructive. You know, can we create a community that cares for one another 
right? And doesn't allow those things to happen, you know? I mean, I realize that's very, very high-minded. So what I ask myself again and again when I find myself getting angry, you know, so, and, you know, and I know, it shows up for me on the road, you know? I, I, I confess, that is, my, that is my weakest link, I feel, that when I am on the road, I can just get so, like, I'll, I'll be peaceful. I'll have meditated and prayed and done my morning routine, you know, and I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good, and I'm in the car 10, 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, there's somebody else in the car that looks a lot like me, and I don't recognize them. You know, they were just so angry about this person doing this and this person doing that. Now, could I channel all of that? Could I take that energy and put it into something productive, into something uh, powerful and uh, maybe even positive? I know if I attack another person, even in my mind, it doesn't usually get me what I want if I tell the truth, right? It just doesn't. Anger is one of those most basic emotions, you know? And, and I think actually it's necessary for our survival because it generates the energy and I think it generates the strength to do things and protect ourselves that maybe we normally could not do. So in that regard, I think it's a really good thing. Everybody has it. Again, everybody has it so you're not bad for it or you're not unspiritual. But why is it so, so difficult to deal with? I think because we deny it mostly. You know, I think because we're afraid of it. Oh, my God, if I let my anger out. We, all, we probably know people like this that say, have said to us, oh, I, I have so much anger inside me. If I let it out, I don't know what I would do. See, I think we've been taught from a very early age that all anger is bad. You know, that, you know, from when we were little, I remember this from when we were little, that other people don't like us when we're angry, you know, when we're just little people ourselves. And we have, may have been told that we have no right to be angry. You have no right to be angry because we have to consider the other people's feelings before we consider ourselves. You know, as children, I think we learn to deny and repress feelings of anger. I really do. So, so we'll not be labeled bad. Right? Because if you think back to the kids in school who were angry, they usually got a label slapped on them that they were bad kids. Now, if we let it out, I think we often feel guilty and have to justify those feelings. Well, they made me so mad. They made me do it. They made me say that. Now, I suspect we all learned pretty young that if we express anger, we're bad. And if we repress it, it grows into rage. Yes. <laughs> and, and, if we, and, so, and that's bad. And if we deny it, we learn, if we deny it, we learn not to trust our feelings. And that also feels bad, right? So I think we have to give ourselves permission to be angry, okay? But I don't have to express that anger out in the world in unhealthy ways. So I'll give myself permission to be angry. I don't think I can control those feelings of anger. Um, but I can notice them, right? And so noticing... We say in Science of Mind that awareness is curative. So when I start to notice, oh, in this situation, I get angry. Oh, around these people, I get angry. Oh, when I watch or listen to this, I feel this tremendous anger. So notice that, right? Because, because we don't always know why or when or how we're going to become angry. You know, I don't know if you ever feel angry for no apparent reason, but I've certainly woken up with that. And sometimes you may expect to feel angry, but you don't. And isn't that strange? You know that in some situations, I just knew I was going to get all worked up about it, and then I'll just be like, hmm, I guess I'm just going to observe this. Hmm, no anger. Wow, that's interesting. See, I think, um, I think the feeling of anger is very different from the expression of anger. I think right now on the face of the earth, there are lots of things that should outrage us, and they do, you know? But how am I going to express that, right? We can't control the feelings but I think we can control the expression of that anger. What do I choose to do with this that I'm feeling right now? I think we've been taught um, to confuse the feeling of anger with angry behaviors that we might exhibit. I think a lot of people are afraid of what will really happen if they let their anger out, you know? That they see themselves like as this powder keg and that every once in a while there's like a little Tupperware burp you know, where a little of it squeaks out, you know, but then they get that lid back on really, really tightly because they are never going to let that out. You know, so, so if, if we repress and we deny our anger, as, as people so often do, um, you know, what I've seen again and again is that 
will simmer for a while, but then ultimately it will explode in a rage. You know, like, um, remember when we were young, people had um, pressure cookers? They're very different today. But in the old days, I remember I had an aunt who had a pressure cooker, and, um, and you know, it was this little aluminum pot, and the, the lid would, had a little thing that spun around, and steam was shooting all over the place. And if you looked at the ceiling above her stove, you would notice that there were a number of dents and divots in the ceiling from where the lid had actually flown off at some point, you know? And, um, and I think that's what happens with, with our anger. You know, we can suppress it and suppress it and suppress it and suppress it, but then somebody does some perhaps little thing and people have a huge reaction. Well, that reaction had nothing to do or very little to do with that something that somebody did. It was all the suppressed stuff that had been in there for so long. <sighs> I think, you know, if we don't become aware of how this operates in our life and our body-mind, it's ultimately a very self-destructive thing to us. So what to do? I think we have to accept the angry feelings when they occur. Oh, wow, I'm angry. That doesn't mean I need to act on it, but to notice it, right? Because again, awareness is curative. So starting to notice. We don't act on every single feeling and thought we have, do we? No, we don't. We're big people now, <laughs> right? You know, we always have choices of what to do. So notice, I'm angry, all right. Hmm, now what do I want to do with this? I feel this angry energy, what do I want to do with it? How can I feel okay having this come up within me? Now, you might express it, you might think about it, you might pray about it, you might meditate, you might sit down and do a little journaling. There are lots of things we can do because this is what I love about science of mind. Science of mind says, yes, you notice where you are, but we have all these tools to work within consciousness, tools at our disposal to help us define our experience. So yeah, I'm angry right now, but what do I want to do with that? I don't just have to sit with it or feel like I'm burdened by it. And in some cases, we might even choose to let it go. I talked about that last week. You know, number one way, I think that there's, there's a number one way or there's a primary way we all act, react, maybe respond when we're angry. You know, and I think that actually any response any anger is, is okay as long as you take responsibility for it and you feel all right with yourself. You know, if you can't get past it, then you need help, right? If you can't get past it, and how often have we heard people say, I just can't get past this thing they did. I just can't get past this thing they said. I just can't get past. So mostly, if you recognize your anger in the moment, you feel it, you accept your feelings without judgment, that's enough, I think, for the feelings to start to abate. They, they will recede. They really will. If I recognize it and feel it in the moment, wow, I was had a big reaction to that on the inside. It doesn't mean you're, you're expressing it on the outside. You know, people have told me that they are afraid of that anger because they feel out of control, right? If I get angry, I will be out of control. People feel out of control, I think, because they don't trust themselves, right? when they let their feelings overwhelm them and they take, don't take responsibility for their actions, okay? This is science of mind. We are very much about taking responsibility. If we feel out of control, you know, think of, think of yourself as an elevator, right? <laughs> Here's an analogy for today, a metaphor for today. Today, you're an elevator, okay? And elevators react when somebody pushes the buttons, right? And so anybody, Anybody can come along, and here you are, an elevator with a whole big panel of buttons, right? And anybody can come along and just start pushing buttons, right? And there you go, angry, mad, upset, revengeful, depressed, blah, blah, blah. So what's the solution? Stop being an elevator, right? <laughs> now people say, I get around my family and my family pushes my buttons. How many times have we heard people say that? Oh yes, I've said it myself. And I've really thought about that and I realized the reason why family has such an incredible capacity to push your buttons is they were there when the buttons were installed. So they know right where they are, right? But then other people come into our life and we are just like a big button waiting to be pushed in their presence. 
Isn't that interesting? Right? So if I say, okay, I'm not going to be an elevator anymore. I'm going to hang an outer order sign on the elevator. I'm going to re stop reacting to what other people do and what, what, uh, what I th think I should be doing. We want to not allow ourselves to become someone else's victim, is what this is. You know? So people maybe are involved in the scenario that, yeah, they push the buttons, but they didn't install them, right? And so the button, if my button gets pushed, it truly is my responsibility to unwire, to disconnect that button, right? No one has the right to your personal power, I think, you know? No one can control you unless you give them your personal power. This is why we're, we're not uh, big on blaming ourselves or other people. It's just about being responsible for what you're feeling, you know, and act rather than react, right? You can disconnect those buttons, really, you can, especially before you see people who push them. So I will tell you a little confession. In my early years in science of mind, I would go back east to visit my family two or three times a year, and about a month before I would go, I would really <laughs> ramp up my spiritual practice. I don't know how to say that any differently. But I would meditate twice as much as I normally meditated. And I would pray a lot more than I was praying. And I would do more spiritual reading. And I would do some journaling. And I would just really like get serious about it because I was now going to be with my birth family the people I incarnated with, right? So these are important souls on my journey. This is where my soul came into the game, right? And I found that when I did that, my buttons were much less likely to be pushed, right? Because what I was doing essentially was saying, okay, here I am, I'm back. You haven't seen me in six months. You know where the buttons are, push them. Everybody have at it, right? That's what was happening until I started to do more work consciously before I went, you know? And so all that extra praying and all that extra meditating, I'd be around these people and they would just say the things that they had always said, you know, those things that people say, and do the things that they had always done, you know, those things that people always do. Mm, 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 mm. Hmm? And I noticed that I had significantly less reaction. I was not 100%, but I'm going to say I was 80%. I was much better than I had been in the past. And it was like, aha, there is something to this. There is something to this. I get to respond. I get to act, but not react. We really can disconnect those buttons. Because what others do is their choice. We say that all the time. What other people do, that's their karma. How we respond is our karma, right? So where can you exert control or dominion? Dominion's a better word. Where can I exert dominion over my behavior? Where can I exert dominion over my feelings? See, and I know people like to say, but I've been this way my whole life. Why change now? Because it's not working. It's not working. I mean, in a personal way, in a global way. It's not working, so we need to change. It's no, it, 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 just, it just no longer works. We need to change. When things are, are working, great. But, you know, I don't think we have to look far or hard to find evidence that things are not. So when we're looking for new answers, I think that's a good thing. I really do. I think that's really good. It shows us that there's something not working because there's a, what I think of as the divine agitation. So you know, you've all heard this, but I love this. That within an oyster, when a grain of sand gets in an oyster, it, it, it just irritates the oyster. And the oyster's way of dealing with that is that it makes a pearl out of the irritation. right? So in pain, we try something new to alleviate the pain. But pain, I think, is actually a great incentive for change. In fact, I have found most often that that is a bigger motivator for people than um, something not painful, you know? Um, if you don't do this, you'll be fired. That's a big incentive, right? If you don't do this, you'll be dead by Christmas. That's a big incentive. Those are big motivators, that kind of pain, right? But then if you say, well, you know, if you do this, 
there'll be a lovely little prize for you at the end of the month. <laughs> people aren't going to get on board. People, most people just don't get on board with that. I wish it were differently. There's a line in A Course in Miracles I love. It says that God can teach us through joy or God can teach us through pain, but the choice is ours. You know, and so people ask a lot. They say, well, why the pain? Why the difficulty? Why do we have to have that? And, you know, I don't think we do. I really don't. I don't see any spiritual reason why we have to have it, except for the fact that it really gets our attention, except for the fact that it makes us very serious about our spiritual practice. So I don't know. I suspect that you were like me and that there's probably some anger that rattles around in your cage. And maybe there are certain people that really bring it to the surface. They might be family members. They might be exes. You know, for all of us, it's it's, it's uh, uh, a slight variation on the theme. But I don't think that denying the anger or saying we're not anger, angry is a healthy thing. In fact, I think if we notice something in the world again and again and again, and every time we notice it, we have a big reaction. So, so uh, there are just, you know, there's so many things. The menu is seemingly infinite. But of the things we could get angry about, if you just get angry about it but do nothing else, then you're not really being part of a solution, right? And, and I think we all understand that, that if, if some, we say in science of mind, if something is so, there's a reason why it's so. And so if something keeps reaching out to you and grabbing your attention, like, hey, you, bop, 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 pay attention to this. This makes you angry again and again. It's probably because we're supposed to put some of our energy into that, into holding the light for that, into being a solution for that. And that might mean that we say, all right, every day I am going to pray for an end to um, what? Children's sex trafficking. That's an ugly topic, isn't it? You know, and yet it's a real problem. It continues to exist. It's all over the world. And so if that's something that disturbs you, or if homelessness disturbs you, or hunger, or food insecurity for children that they're, you know, little children who are going to school without food, there are so many things that we could be just incensed about. But to just be mad alone and not do anything doesn't help, does it? No. It's like knowing the medicine is in the medicine cabinet, but I refuse to go into the bathroom. Right? I, I'm, no, I'm just not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. You know? So I think that the way spirit works, I believe, at least in my life, the way spirit works, is spirit brings things to my attention. God says, here, this troubles you. Here, this troubles you. Here, this troubles you. And that means that I get to do a little bit of karma yoga here. I get to take some action in the world. You know, in Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes says, change your thinking and change your life. So he wants you to build a big, strong, beautiful, healthy, loving consciousness. And then, not just sit at home with that big, beautiful, loving, healthy consciousness, but then take some action in the world to put, that, to, you know, to put some feet to your prayers, to do something with it. And I know that that will be different for each of us. Let's pray. So thank you. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment, remembering that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. That spirit that is intelligence itself, that creates us out of itself, is right where we are. We are surrounded and filled with the love, the intelligence, the wisdom, the peace, the compassion, the joy that God is. And in this awareness of our connection with God, I also know we are all connected with each other. And that by sharing these ideas, they are more powerful. And so I claim for us today that we are aware where we have anger and we are aware where the Spirit of God within us is prompting us to take some action in the world, whether that's pray on a daily basis for that situation, or to roll up our sleeves in some way, or to give some money to that cause, or do something else that's part of a solution. I know that will be different and is different for each and every one of us, but I declare for us today that we are open, willing vessels. We are here to be guided by that presence of the living Spirit into what is right for us to do, what is right for us to be. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, parents, children, all of those we love and hold near and dear. And we know that right where they are, God is present in its fullness. So we know healing is the order of the day. Love is the order of the day. Peace and harmony. We think about the world that we live in right now and so many things are pulling at our attention. And so we could just be angry about it, or we could say, what else is present within me? Is there any compassion? 
Is there any love? Is there any tenderness? Is there any goodness within me that I can extend out into the world? And now what is mine to do, Spirit? Reveal to me. Show me in a way I understand if there's some action I'm supposed to take. Is this something I should pray for every day, twice a day? Is it someplace I should volunteer? I know that the Spirit responds to our sincere invitation. And so I know we are open, willing vessels for what's ours to do. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams and all paths to God. And I know we're blessed by being together, that all of us get raised up. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I say, thank you, God. I release this word into law. And so it is. Amen. All right, we'll sing one time together. I invite you to hold your gift over your heart and we'll say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you very much.
the kind that lasts forever. Yeah. We're in this love together. The kind that'll last forever. I'm saying ever, forever, yeah. Thank you, Mary. You can get Mary's music by emailing her at m-a-r-h-y-l-c at aol.com. <laughs> and thank you, Sam and Karen. So now it's time for announcements. <laughs> if this is your first time at our church, we're delighted you're here. Please stop by the welcome table to pick up a packet of information just for you. We make it easy for you to make donations to our church. The text to give number and QR code are on your program. Or you can go to nhcrs.org slash give. Prayer with a practitioner is available after service in person and on Zoom. Wednesday evening service with Reverend Sidney Steen. The meditation starts at 6.50 and the service is at 7. This week, Reverend Sidney shares on the topic, the power of right thinking. Grief support. This group, facilitated by practitioner Carol Winokur, meets today at 1 o'clock on Zoom. All are welcome. Abundance Workshop 2022 with Dr. Mark Vieira. First four Mondays in August on Zoom only. Dr. Mark brings over 30 years of experience and wisdom to this amazing workshop where you'll learn how to expand your prosperity consciousness. Class will be from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And the book, and it will be based on the book Spiritual Economics by Eric Butterworth. Sign up today on our website. The cost is responsible giving. I've read that book, it's great. Save the dates. Come walk the labyrinth, Friday, August 19th, and or Saturday, August the 20th. Details will be forthcoming. Zoom virtual patio before and after Sunday and Wednesday services. Zoom meditation every morning, Monday through Saturday from 7.55 to 8.15. Visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain Zoom links and more information about all our events and to sign up for weekly e-blasts and Monday monthly newsletters. Let's all stand and sing the peace song.
So please repeat after me. I'm at home in the heart of God. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I am living love. Amen. Thank you.